statement of faith that it is well with me. It is well with me not because of who I am or because of what I do or what I've done. It is well with me because Jesus Christ has loved me and Jesus Christ has forgiven me of my sins and Jesus has saved me from hell and given life and hope and peace to my soul. And Father, this morning, whether we are in the midst of the storms or whether we are on top of the mountain, whether our hearts are filled with brokenness and sorrow or joy and celebration, we simply pray that the reality of those words would sink into our souls and it really would be well with us. Let us hear your voice. We just want to surrender to you and be led by you and hear from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, my name is Mike Cardello, and this is my journey to freedom. I was born in Connecticut. The motto for our Italian family was food, fun, and sports. At 19, being an adult, I wanted more, so I moved to California. I got a wonderful job uh, working at a liquor store. And for me, that was really good because I found out where all the parties were. I was the life of the party because we would bring booze. There I was introduced to cocaine. I loved cocaine. I was soon married three years later, and I brought my alcohol and drug habit into a marriage. I soon went into my first rehab, a 30-day program. Got out of that program and didn't last very long and continued using. Had many affairs, and soon that marriage was over. I moved back to Connecticut and continued partying there. I was arrested for possession of cocaine in Connecticut. I went through a drug program, didn't last very long after that, and was in another rehab. This rehab was for one year. Being accepted on staff after one year at that rehab, I was soon asked to leave because I was drinking and drugging again. I moved to Florida. Soon I was married to a second woman, again bringing all my drinking and drugging habits there. I went into my third rehab, a 30-day program. I got out of there and did well for a little while. Then I was arrested again for possession of cocaine. My life has been a, a, a continual struggle of drinking and drugging. For 30 years I did this. I was soon divorced again and had nowhere to turn. My life had hit a bottom. I contemplated suicide. A friend of mine said to me I was out of control. I needed to celebrate recovery. You know, I didn't, I didn't think too much of it because it's just another program. And, but there I was, I was accepted and I felt really good about it. The guys took me to six meetings and on the seventh night, we went to church. It was there that I heard all the words from scripture, from the pastor's mouth, and I, I knew, I knew that's what I needed. And that night I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I sat in the pew and I just cried because I felt for the first time, I felt so fulfilled and so, such inner peace. I never had that feeling before ever. And I knew that Jesus Christ was with me. You know, my whole life began to change. It was exciting. It's hard to describe, but I had a brand new life. I was becoming a new person. Three years of being sober, God gave me my wife today, Polly. We're married for 40 years. It's been an incredible journey, uh, giving back, working the program, studying the Word of God, and now we're raising, for a year and a half, our grandchild, Charlie, who's soon to be nine years old. It's just, it's just an incredible journey I'm so thankful that God has forgiven me for all of my past. If he can do this for me, he can do this for you.
You know, I, I really appreciate those uh, stories of the journey to freedom, and I uh, hope you do too. And one of the really cool things is uh, Mike, who's on this, is one of uh, six guys that we are having a special service for tonight uh, at 5 o'clock here to uh, ordain to the pastoral ministry. Uh, God has been raising up leaders and sending us people, and so we get to set apart some men who are serving God already and, and acknowledge them as, uh, as those who uh, are servants of Christ and pastors to his congregation. So that's at 5 o'clock tonight. Everybody's welcome to come and join us for this special service. Uh, I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Exodus chapter 16 uh, as we're continuing our study called Journey to Freedom. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's okay. There's some of the pews that look just like this one. Turn to page 73. And uh, by the way, if you need a Bible, take one of these home with you. We'd love for you to have the Word of God, use the Word of God, let it speak into your life because we know it will change you. Uh, I want you to know that our journey to freedom is filled with obstacles. And their purpose is to teach us to trust Christ. To teach us to trust that God provides. So uh, we usually recognize the big obstacles, don't we? Those, those things that get in the way that are really like mountains in front of us. Kind of like the Israelites had, uh, we talked about last week. They, they were caught between the Egyptian army that was pursuing them and the Red Sea. And they didn't know how they were going to get through that. And then God worked a miracle and he parted the Red Sea and they went across. And, and the Egyptians drowned and uh, they were delivered and they could celebrate and say, look at what God did. It was awesome. He's so powerful and so wonderful. But a lot of times it's the ordinary obstacles that trip us up, isn't it? Uh, our text today, we're going to be looking at three stories that are found in Exodus 15, 16, and 17. I'm not going to read them all because there's a, a lot of uh, passages there. But the big story is this. The Israelites relied on God for food and water on their journey to freedom. Sounds like no big deal. Of course, they're relying on God for food and water on their journey to freedom. They're out in the wilderness. They're wandering. But, uh, but this is the crux of what is try, Scripture is trying to communicate to us to notice and to learn. If you weren't with us last week, here's what's happened to this point. God asked Moses to lead the Israelites to freedom. He's finally said yes after a lot of conversation with God. Went to the Israelites that were in slavery in Egypt and, and led them to freedom through the ten plagues that God sent on the nation. Finally, Pharaoh said, get out of here. Changed his mind and, and pursued them. Caught them at the Red Sea where God did the miracle of parting the waters and the Israelites walked across. This is taking place, the story picks up three days after the Red Sea. Chapter 15 has a story where it's three days out and they're thirsty. They need water. They come to a well or a spring and that spring is tainted. The water is bitter. They can't drink it. And God tells Moses to take a log and throw it in the water and it turns the water sweet. It, they're able to drink that. Chapter 16, 45 days out of captivity, and they run out of food. You know, when they left Egypt, they packed all their stuff, took their food with them, and, and along the way, they've been eating it, and they get to that point where they're going, hey, we had food in Egypt, and now we're hungry, we're going to die out here. And so God sent quail at night and provided manna in the daytime. If you don't know what manna is, they didn't either. Okay. In fact, the word manna in Hebrew literally translated means, what is it? <laughs> so they're like, God provided, what is it for them? It's like bread, it's like coriander seed, they have all kinds of descriptions, they just don't know what it is. It's miracle bread that God gave them. And, and that continued uh, the entire time they were in the wilderness. And, and then chapter 17, they're still traveling in the desert. They need water again. And the people say, we're going to die out here of thirst. You're, you're killing us. And so God told Moses to take some of the leaders. They went ahead and, and God said, strike that rock with your staff. You know, the staff that, you know, you raised and the Red Sea parted. The staff that turned into a snake uh, to show the people that I was with you. And, and so he hit the rock and water came out. And God provided water. God provides for his people and we need to remember that on this journey to freedom, it is filled with obstacles to teach us to trust God. Now, if we're followers of Jesus Christ, what are the applications 
for us. What does this mean for us? These stories that are, that are there, and there's three of them, back to back to back, and, and that's for a significant reason, because God wants to teach us something. So if we're followers of Jesus Christ, if we believe that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world, if we believe that he died on the cross to pay for our sins and was raised from the dead, and we have made a commitment to Jesus, then we are on a journey to freedom. And on that journey, we're going to have obstacles. And those obstacles are to teach us to trust God and that God provides. So the first application I'd like to make to our lives is that God provides in his way and in his time. Three different needs, well, two needs. They needed water twice, they needed food once, and how did God provide? Different ways. First time, they throw a log into bad water and it turns it good. Second time with water, strike a rock with your staff. Now, I'm pretty sure that everyone in this room has kicked rocks, thrown rocks, hit rocks. Anyone ever produce water out of it? I don't think so. God does, provides in his way and his time. And then he provided food. They're hungry, right? He provides food by sending flocks of suicidal quail. <laughs> That's what they were. You read the story, and the birds just descended on the camp in the evening, and they went out there and just grabbed them. They didn't have to, like, get nets. They didn't have shotguns and stuff like that. They're, the birds were like, okay, here I am. Eat me. You know? It's like uh, Old Testament Kentucky Fried Chicken that delivers. Night after night after night, and, and then they have the miracle bread that shows up in the morning, whatever it is. You see, God provides in his way and in his time, and we need to remember that because a lot of times, if we're really honest, we want God to be our genie instead of our Heavenly Father. We want to come to God in prayer like it's some kind of magic lamp that we're rubbing, and we get really frustrated when God doesn't give us what we want when we want it. And see, God is inviting us into an intimate relationship with him. A relationship that, that we understand him as our loving heavenly father. And I know some of you didn't have loving earthly fathers that blessed you. But God wants you to know that he is your loving father who wants to bless you. And he wants you to share your hopes and your dreams and your fears and your failures and your needs and your wants with him. And out of this parent-child relationship... Where God is the parent and we're the children, sometimes God gives us what we want. I mean, sometimes you give your kids what they want, don't you? Sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes you give them what they need. And that's what God does with us. Sometimes he gives us what we want. Sometimes he gives us what we need. And sometimes God tells us no. Right? Because we don't need it. Might still want it. Sometimes God is annoying and points out that what we say we need, we really just want. And we're frustrated by that. Hey, let's, let's look at the area of finances. Okay, a lot of us have uh, come to God at some point in our life and said, God, I need you to provide financially. We need help. You know, we need help to pay our bills. We need help to buy groceries. We need help uh, to, you know, get a new car because ours is breaking down. We need help to send our kids to college. God, can you help us? And we've prayed and asked God to provide resources. And, and, uh, and sometimes God answers that prayer by giving us a raise or a promotion or a new job. And at that point, we're like, yay, God, look what God did. And we, we trumpet that to people, don't we? Hey, God answered my prayer. He did this. Or sometimes God will actually give us one of those miracle windfall checks, right? I know you've heard stories. I've, I've heard stories. I've had occasions in my life where like, hey, we're short $200. And you go to the mailbox and you get an unexpected refund check for something you didn't remember for $201. And you kind of go, wow, God is so cool, isn't he? And you tell people about it. Look, God provides. And sometimes God just tells us spend less. Right? Cut your budget. And we don't like that. We're like, boo. <laughs> I wanted you to answer that prayer differently, God. I wanted one of those checks in the mail. Right? And he, and he just does. He says, you know what? Honestly, uh, you can drive the car for another year. And we can. Or honestly, you know, you can, uh, you can make do without all the TV channels. Right? <laughs> Or honestly, God will tell us, hey, you know what? You can actually eat at home. 
You can do it. That's why houses have kitchens. <laughs> right? That's, that's part of it. You see, God provides in his way, in his time for his people, but God provides. This really hit home with me uh, in, in thinking about the Sweetwater building project. Uh, if you don't know what we're doing, we, we own 12 acres over on uh, Sweetwater Avenue, straight across the highway from Dairy Queen. And, uh, uh, and we're, we're actually building on it right now. It's not going as fast as I want, but we're making progress. You know, I want it to be done now. Uh, but, uh, but they are doing stuff out there. They dropped a little, you know, manager house to live in while, while it's going on. And, and, uh, and I see stuff happening, so uh, I want it to happen now. I just go. But God knows I'm impatient. He's working with me. So, uh, but, but understand, we bought that property 11 years ago. And so for 11 years, we've been moving towards this. And for 11 years, every time I drive by the property, I've asked God to give us the resources that we need so that we can go ahead and build now. You realize that God didn't answer my prayer for 11 years. You know, we're moving towards it. He just kept telling me to wait. And I didn't want to wait. And I kept saying, God, but you have the resources. You can give us these. You can do this. You can do this miraculously. You just give it to us. And you know what I came to realize? A few months ago when I was having the same conversation with God that I've had thousands of times and it occurred to me that God had blessed us by not giving us the resources when I wanted them. Because if he had given us the resources when I wanted them, we would have built the wrong thing. Or worse, we wouldn't have been ready for what God wants to do when we occupy Sweetwater. Can I just tell you, I really believe that when we occupy the new building, not, not because it's, uh, it's uh, you know, an awesome new building, but because we're going to have more space and we're going to have more parking and we're going to have more visibility and all that kind of stuff, that God's going to send thousands of people that, that don't know Jesus Christ, that need to know Jesus and experience that life-changing relationship. He's going he's gonna to send them. And here's the thing. If God had answered my prayer years ago, we would not have been ready. And we would have missed the opportunity of the blessing that God had for us. And I believe that we're going to be ready and we're going to see life change happen on a scale that, that is amazing. Where we will all sit in awe of God's greatness and his power. Because God provides in his way and in his time for his people. But God provides. Second application. You're not trusting God when you're complaining. You're not trusting God when you're complaining. Exodus chapter 16, uh, the beginning of the story about the manna and the, the, how God provided. Pick up in verse 2. It says this, And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Chapter 17, verse 3. When they're needing water. It says, but the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, why, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? They are not trusting God. They are complaining. They're whining. They're griping. They're moaning about their condition. And this is amazing because the Israelites had just experienced the power of God in ways that we have never seen on the scale that we've never experienced. They had lived through the ten plagues. They would seen what God had done to the greatest nation on the face of the earth. They had been delivered through the Red Sea. They walked on dry land with walls of water on either side of them and then watched the Egyptians drown. And they're freaking out about food and water. Does that not just like strike anybody as like incredible? Because you look at this and you're going, hey, why are you not looking for another miracle? Instead, all they can talk about is how good they had it in slavery. We had food when we were slaves. It would have been better to be a comfortable slave than to be free and face all these challenges. So how are you describing your life? How are you talking about the challenges and struggles that you're facing? If you're complaining, you're not trusting God. 
And we're talking about complaining, you know, I'm talking about, you know, whining and griping and moaning about life and how terrible it is and how difficult it is. I'm not talking about acknowledging the reality of struggles and, and, and identifying the, the difficulties and the obstacles and the hardships. Uh, that's a different thing. I'm not even talking about just saying, hey, pray for me. It's tough. I'm talking about if we're complaining, we're not trusting because God wants to lead us to freedom. He's involved in this. And to get there, you and I have to trust him. We have to trust him. We have to be willing to follow even when it's hard. And by the way, God told us it was going to be hard. Jesus never said, hey, if you guys follow me, it's going to be like cake and ice cream all the way. It's going to be smooth sailing and we're just going to have a party one day after the other. It's going to be great. No. What did Jesus actually say? He said, if anyone's going to come after me, he has to deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus said, hey, it's going to be hard, but it's going to be worth it. It's going to be hard, but it's going to lead you to freedom. And we have to remember that because slavery always appears more comfortable. And our habits, our patterns of destructive behavior, our addictions are always going to call us back. They're always going to say, hey, come on. Remember you had meat when you were a slave in Egypt. It's better when you're a slave. Come on back to slavery. So how are you talking about your life? If you were to listen in on your conversations, do you hear trust or do you hear complaint? See, it's complaint when we're saying things like, oh, it must be nice for them. Look what they got. They got a nicer house or car or boat or they got a better job and money. How come I never get blessed like that? It's not fair. Nothing good ever happens to me. See, if that's descriptive of you, then you're not trusting God to lead your life. You're not following him to freedom. And God is calling us to freedom. And a lot of us have a list of questions. And we're like, God, I'm going to follow you to freedom. As soon as you tell me, uh, how long are we going to be on the road? And where are we going to stop? And when are we going to eat? And are we going to do any shopping along the way? And I, and I just get this sense that the Holy Spirit of God, at least to me, is saying, shut up and follow. Don't you realize where I'm taking you? And sometimes we don't. Sometimes we forget. We can't see it, and so we forget about it. But God is taking us to freedom. And it's time to realize that God wants to bless us and stop playing the games and whining and griping and bargaining with God and just follow him. We need to follow him because God is offended when we don't trust him. God is offended when we don't trust him. In in chapter 16, toward the end of the manna story, uh, you know, God gave really specific instructions to the Israelites about the manna and about the quail. He said, gather enough for one day each day. And if they gathered enough and had leftovers for the next day, uh, it turned wormy in the morning. Kind of gross, yeah. So that was his incentive for them to gather enough for one day. Because he wanted them to trust him every day. And he said, but on the sixth sixth day, you'll gather enough for two days. Because I want you to have a Sabbath. I want you to rest. I want you to honor me. And so I'm going to give you enough for two days. Then you gather enough for two days. So pick up verse 27, chapter 16. It says, on the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather. But they found none of the manna. And the Lord said to Moses, listen to this. How long, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. How long, how long are you not going to listen to me? How long are you not going to trust me? God was grieved that they didn't trust him. See, God provides and he wants you and me to trust him to do that. The writer of Hebrews uh, chapter 11 verse 6 says it so bluntly. And without faith it is impossible to please God. Did you hear that? Without faith it's impossible to please God for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Our faith is necessary 
to be pleasing to God. In other words, when we doubt God, we don't trust God, then we're offending him. And, and, and get this, because there's a lot of people who are raised in church where it's like, hey, if you just keep the rules, you know, if you're just a good person and you don't break any of the big ten, you know, in, in the obvious ways, and, uh, and you show up each week, then your life is uh, good before God. And, and what I'm telling you is we can offend God simply by not trusting him. You, you can look the part, you, you can dress the part, you can act the part, you can show up here, but if you're not exercising a life of faith, then it's offensive to God. Hey, if you ever invite me over to your house, you know, for dinner or for a party or something like that, which I'm not opposed to, uh, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to probably ask you a question. And the question is going to be this. Do you have Diet Pepsi? Look, I got a drinking problem, and, uh, you know, and it's Diet Pepsi, and I drink an ungodly amount. And so I'm just going to ask you straight up, because I want to have a good time at your house, and I'm going to say, do you have Diet Pepsi? And if you tell me, yes, you have Diet Pepsi, and I show up with a six-pack of Diet Pepsi, do I trust you? <laughs> no, I don't. No, I don't. And, and, and so, you know, that would be offensive to you, because you look at me and say, hey, I bought it just for you, and you brought your own. That's, that's rude. That's offensive. Because I'm not trusting. Years ago, uh, uh, we took my kids to, to kids camp. They were young. And, uh, and we were doing this, you know, trust exercise. You know, when you're at youth camp, you do the crazy trust falls. You have kids fall off, you know, really high things. And you catch them and you prove that, that you know, teach them trust. And, uh, and so with the kids, we were doing like a little baby trust fall, you know, and they're little. I mean, you know, my, my daughter, my youngest daughter was like six. And so she's little. It's so, it, you know, it's really crazy safe. And they were, we're dropping them off like from one step down, you know, hey, just lean back and we'll catch you. And, uh, and some of the kids were doing it. And some of the kids were, were balking. They, wouldn't, they didn't want to do it. So I thought, hey, I got my daughter and I'm doing this. So I'm going to have her show them how to do it. And so I, I put her there and I said, okay, Alyssa, uh, I want you to fall back and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch you. And <laughs> she said, no. So I explained to her, you know, that she knew I was her dad and I loved her and, and she could trust me and, and all this kind of stuff. And so now you can fall back and I'll catch you. And she wouldn't do it. So now I'm like, you know, my pride is offended because people are watching. And I was kind of like, listen, I love you and I'm not going to drop you. So trust me and fall into my arms now. And she said no and burst into tears. I was being a bad parent. I can tell you that that was, to this day, the single most painful moment of my parenting of my kids when they were little. I was so hurt by her lack of trust at that point. I knew that she loved me, and she knew that I loved her. I knew that she trusted me and all that kind of stuff, but she didn't trust me. She didn't demonstrate that trust in that way at that moment, and, and, and it hurt me. And I wonder if that isn't how God feels about us when we don't trust him. Because he's provided salvation for us in Jesus. He's provided all the things that we have in life, and then he asks us to trust him, and we we hesitate. And God wants to bless us like crazy. He desires to lead us to freedom. And the only way to get there is to trust him. So how does God want you to trust? How does God want you to trust? This is a question that I hope you struggle with all week long. I want this to be something where you and God have a conversation. Because I believe the Holy Spirit in you is going to be nudging you and saying, I want you to trust me this way. Because I know that some of you here, God wants you to trust him by following him for the very first time. You're hearing the voice of God. You're sensing the presence of God. You've never made that commitment to say, Jesus is my Lord, my Savior. I believe, I follow. And God wants you to trust him by saying, I surrender to Jesus. He, I, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. He wants you to trust him by demonstrating to the world that you're following Jesus Christ in baptism. And you know that you've never done that, and you kind of get that feeling. Every time you see somebody get baptized up here or hear about it, you're like, I should do that. And is that how God wants you to trust him? Or maybe God wants you to trust him with your life, with your health. 
You know, Jesus said, don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all the rest will be taken care of. You know, the, the psalmist, David, he, he said, look, all of my days were ordained before one of them came to be. Paul said, look, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And, and in other words, it, it's, it's only going to get better. It's only going to get better. To live to, is Christ, to die is gain. It's improvement. And so if Jesus Christ is your Savior, he's promised you eternity. He's promised you a place that he's prepared for you. And, and he's going to take you to be there. And, and so, you know, if you're afraid, if you're concerned, if you're worried about your life, about your health, you know, guess what? I, I got good news and I got bad news. The bad news is we're going to die. It's appointed unto man once to die and then to face judgment. I know we, a lot of you are hoping that Christ comes back before then and we don't have to go through death. Every generation since Jesus has pretty much hoped that. So don't bank on it. But here's the thing. Whether your life is wonderful right now or whether your life is terrible right now, the promise is it's only going to get better. And we might be afraid of the pain. We might be afraid of the process. We might be afraid of the stuff that goes on with the whole dying thing. That's normal. But here's the thing. Are you willing to trust God with your life, with your health? Because it's not how long you live. It's how well we live. Or maybe God wants you to trust him with forgiveness. Um, the Apostle Paul said, do not take your own revenge, but leave room for the wrath of God. For vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. God wants you to trust him with forgiveness. He wants you to trust him with justice. I, you see, that's what, that's what revenge is. That's what hatred is. I want to make them pay. I want to get even. I want to see them suffer. I want to make it right. And God says, my job. It's my job. Let me handle that. Trust me. And, and I'll take care of it. You trust me to forgive because forgiveness is healing. Forgiveness is life. Trust me that forgiveness is freedom. So does God want you to trust him with forgiveness? Or maybe God wants you to trust him with finances. With your money. This is a huge obstacle for a lot of us who follow Christ. Because God asks us to give him back 10% of what he gives us. 10% of what we make. He asks us to do that. In, in uh, Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. God's talking and he says to his people. Bring the full tithe 10% into the storehouse. That there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test. Says the Lord of hosts. God dares us. Dares us. The only place in scripture that he ever does this. Where he ever says, it's okay to test me in this. Here's what he says. Test me in this, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. God wants us to trust him. And, and do you know what tithing is? Tithing is one way that God asks you and me to trust him with our finances. He's saying, look, trust me. You're going, I, I can't afford to do that. There's no way I can give God 10%. And God's saying, trust me. I'll, I'll take care of you. I'll provide for you if you trust me. And a lot of us are like, yeah, I can't do that. And I think God feels like I did when my daughter wouldn't fall into my arms. Why not? I want to bless you. I want to do this in your life. And you're not letting me. And some of you are going, well, you know, if God will bless me, then I'll give generously. <laughs> and God is saying, no, it's not how it works. You trust me. You give generously. And I will bless your socks off. The question is, do we trust God? Do you trust God? The Israelites discovered that God provides. Have you figured that out yet? Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can trust you. Thank you for your patience and your love in our lives. Thank you for the grace that sets us free. And Lord, this morning we simply want to hear your voice. 
God, I pray that we'd hear your voice all this week as you call us to trust you more. And give us the courage, give us the faith, give us the, the will to follow you into freedom. God, you know the big obstacles that stop us. You know the little obstacles that trip us up. We simply want to walk in your steps and be your children and live in your blessing. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God together.